So I'm very happy and, uh, and, and it's a great pleasure to, for us to welcome again to the campus here at your Clan Cyprus in Cyprus, Professor Dimitri Koshnov, with whom I have been working for many, many years. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure. Dimitri has recently moved to the CEU in Budapest, Elvina, and we are very happy about it because uh, Dimitri is now focusing exclusively on the rule of law and leading the rule of law, uh, well, research there. So it's a real pleasure and honor to have you with us and uh, we look forward to listening to you and I'm sure that there will be questions. Thank you, Dimitri. So I have an hour more or less with questions, which means that I will probably speak for 25, 30, 35 minutes, if it's, if it's okay. But, uh, yes, but uh, the, the rule of law is usually, especially the rule of law in, in, in the context of the European Union, is presented uh, negatively as something that is, uh, that, that is uh, in trouble, something that is uh, being abused, destroyed, etc. And my task today is to present a positive picture. At least I will try uh, to present a positive picture uh, because I take the recent revolutionary developments and I will, I will explain why they're revolutionary, uh, especially at the Court of Justice of the European Union, as a, a fundamental new phase that is, that is starting in the, in, in, in the, that affects the nature of the European Union as a constitutional legal system. So, so the story will be a negative story on the ground because what's going on in Poland, Hungary and potentially other member states is absolutely untenable and would not pass any basic uh, scrutiny even at the moment of uh, uh, accession level scrutiny to the European Union. So Hungary or Poland would, would never have a place in the EU today uh, should, they, should they apply it, uh, should they have applied yesterday. Uh, but at the same time, it's absolutely clear uh, that what is going on has fundamental positive impact on the development of the EU as a legal system. And uh, to start with, every legal system, of course, stands in the name of some kind of fundamental principles. Those foundational, foundational principles justify the, 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 the constitutional system as such, and then all these, all these institutions and the legal system uh, work together in order to make sure that these fundamental principles, which are proclaimed in the constitution, uh, actually give uh, are given the true true expression in real life, also in the real life of the law. And this is something that the European Union uh, has not had until recently, because Article Two, uh, although it named the rule of law, democracy, blah blah, human rights, uh, was uh, entirely disconnected. And not only in the minds of the scholars, but also in the minds of the institutions, uh, most notably the Commission, and probably even the Court of Justice, it was entirely disconnected from the key, from the actual enforceable law of the Union. Uh, and this is where we had all this flood of literature saying, actually, uh, Article 2 is not really part of our law, we cannot, we cannot base infringement proceedings on Article 2, uh, we cannot actually actually seek any kind of implementation of Article 2 uh, because uh, basically it has the same value as the, so as the Soviet constitution. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a bunch of general principles which, which don't leave a, an actual life at the, at, at the level of the ground. So nobody, no, nobody can appeal uh, to Article 2 principles. And the court seemed to support that entirely. Because if, if we look at uh, the, the most foundational aspects of these principles in the case law of the Court of Justice until, until pretty much three years ago, uh, then we see empty proclamations and circular reasoning which do not connect uh, with the acquis on the internal market. And uh, we don't need to, 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 to uh, uh, wait for a long time to find the examples of that. So, Lever, the, the most fundamental, the most cited uh, case on the rule of law, uh, where the court said that the communities, it, it predates the union, are actually based on the principle of the rule of law because everything that is done in the communities is based on law, is a great example of that, of that circular reason. Because to say that all what you do in your law is based on law, 
is is to say nothing. The, 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 this kind of approach uh, entirely lacks substance. So if we if we measure uh, Hungarian democracy and rule of law system uh, against the standard established in Liver for the communities, uh, then we will find that Hungary is uh, is the best performing rule of law system in the world. Uh, because of course, Prime Minister Orban has not uh, gone against the letter of the law, and that was exactly the standard until until very recently. And of course, this this helped at a certain point, but this, uh, the, 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 we cannot say that. The rule of law in any uh, more substantive way or understood in, 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 in any thicker way actually affected uh, the way how the European Union functioned. It's, it's one of the most legalistic uh, systems in the world where the law, although interpreted theologically, in fact, uh, in fact works in, in the interest of something else rather than Article 2. And here we can speak about free movement, we can speak about uh, the, the idea of establishing the internal market, uh, competition enforcement, etc. Plenty of goals out there. Uh, but all those goals are not actually the values of, of Article 2, and all those goals uh, are not actually something that is, uh, uh, th that is openly uh, connecting to uh, any kind of human rights rule of law democracy principles. And this is something that was absolutely clear throughout the whole history of the Union and uh, became particularly acute at the moment when uh, the Big Bang enlargement was being prepared. So when all the Central and Eastern European uh, countries were getting ready to, to join the European Union. Uh, because the basic, uh, the basic assumption that uh, somehow transporting the key of the Union uh, and making that a key part of national law of those states was enough in order to comply with the values of the Union, uh, turned out to be absolutely flawed. And uh, that's why the, 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 the European Council had to meet and to, to find out how to enforce the values and to upload the values to all those countries or to download uh, whatever, whatever term you use, uh, could be actually uh, made operational next to their key. And this is where the Copenhagen criteria come from, 1993. Uh, if, you, if you remember the text of the political criteria, uh, it, it included democracy, rule of law, respect, for, respect uh, and protection of minorities, uh, respect and protection of human rights, etc., etc., etc. And that was a political statement by the European Council. That political statement was made next to the criterion of the, of the acceptance of their key in full, which meant that, and, and in practice functioned in that way, it meant that the IK actually didn't incorporate and didn't fully take on board the, the values which are now in Article 2. So to say that the union was always about democracy and rule of law and the protection of human rights is empty talk. This is not true, and this is not true at the level even of the, of the nitty gritty analysis of the law. So there is a cleavage between the IK and the values on which this Aki purportedly is based. And this cleavage has been there from the very beginning, first, uh, first uh, at the unwritten level, because if we, if we look at the predecessors of Article 2, uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't bring us back uh, too far, uh, since all this democracy, human rights, etc., all this was first assumed. And then it was uh, it, it, it was uh, part of of the unwritten key, as Antje Wiener calls it. Uh, so it was uh, the unwritten resources or the potential resources of the key, as she put it in her book, an excellent book, uh, the first one. And uh, the others are also excellent, but uh, this one uh, this one is some uh, the, the one that struck me the most. Uh, so the the, the the informal resources of the key didn't have any kind of textual uh, textual reflection. In the, in the treaties in force, and nevertheless, the court told us that they are primary law. So there was some kind of primary law and values, uh, but they didn't have direct connection to the IKI, and it certainly was not perceived by the member states as enforceable part of EU law, uh, which could be taken up by the, by the candidate countries as they prepare themselves for the membership of the Union. That's why uh, the Copenhagen criteria somehow were necessary. And then Professor Sadursky provided a really compelling analysis 
of the impact of enlargements on the nature of the U.S. constitutional system. This is his, uh, uh, he publishes a monograph per three years, uh, so it's probably uh, eight years ago. He has just published one with Cambridge, the last one was Polish constitutional breakdown with Oxford uh, during the pandemic, and right before the pandemic, uh, he published the one with, uh, also with Oxford on, on, on the impact of uh, enlargements on, on the U.S. constitutional system, and his, his argument is, uh, is unbeatable. He basically tells us all these values, which had no relation to the IP, which were not viewed by the member states as binding in any way or threatened in any way, only appeared as part of constitutional law of the EU as a result of uh, the EU mistrusting the former, uh, the, the, the former Soviet bloc countries. And uh, it's, it's, it's obviously terrible to mistrust someone to such a degree, well, because when we speak about democracy, the law of law, etc., these are the most basic uh, elements of, of the framework of a modern state, liberal democratic state, uh, which would assume. So when we, when we speak about France, when we speak about the Netherlands, etc., we, we never we never actually talk about democracy globally because this is something that essentially characterizes those states. And this kind of essential characterization of, of the states behind the former Iron Curtain didn't apply for some reason. And Sadursky tells us this is all great news, and I fully agree, because suddenly the supranational legal system also acquired the claim to some kind of constitutionality, which actually is based on this foundational, uh, foundational liberal democratic principles, something that has never been there uh, with us before. And so all these proclamations were great, but, uh, but Article 2 was not perceived as enforceable in any way. It was not perceived as, uh, as, as binding or important until the moment when the Court of Justice uh, decided to extend its own jurisdiction to cover the core principles, at least some core principles of the Council. And, and this is where the rule of law revolution starts. Uh, which I described in a small report for the Swedish Institute of uh, Foreign Relations. I don't know exactly uh, how, how the relation works. It's CFs uh, with, uh, with Laurent Pesch. We tried to look at all the case law that, go, that, that, that um, uh, appeared after the Portuguese judge's ruling, and the Portuguese judge, judge's ruling is the first step where the court said, actually, guys, we have jurisdiction to rule on the vital aspects of the constitutional structure of the member states. So the member states obviously never delegated to the European Union, but, but it doesn't matter. This is how the European, this is how the law uh, of the Union has always been developed. Uh, so the Court of Justice took an audacious step. Uh, it boldly reaffirmed the jurisdiction, or actually invented this jurisdiction. And then as a, as a follow-up of that, it came up with, a, with an intricate system of rule of law establishment and enforcement, uh, which, which potentially could apply to the supranational and to the national level. So what, what happened in, in Portuguese judges, of course, is of no relevance to us, and, and it's of no relevance to the court, uh, because it's not the facts uh, that, that make the case law, it's, it's, the, it's, 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 the, it's the rule uh, that, that emerges as a result. So the Court of Justice found that it had jurisdiction to assess whether the complaint by the Portuguese judges that the, that the lowering of their salary, together with the salaries of all the other uh, public servants in Portugal due to the crisis in 2008, was lawful, was something that the court could do. And the court grounded that in the combination of Article 2 and Article 19, and plenty of other, Article 19 is about the, 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 the functioning of the judiciaries of the member states as part of the judiciary of the union, and then the court could find plenty of other instruments as well. So uh, in later case law, we also have references to Article 47 of the Charter. Uh, sometimes we have Article 3 of, of the Treaty on the European Union. We certainly have Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. And, 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 and plenty of other interesting, interesting instruments. Uh, so what resulted was a situation when the Court of Justice told the member states, uh, essentially, if any of your judges or uh, any civil servant with an adjudication, uh, adjudicating function who could in any way be brought within the ambit of Article 19 uh, because that person or that institution can send preliminary references to the Court of Justice. You don't even need to be named the court, of course, because 
uh, because that's a supranational definition, not the national definition, uh, then we will tell you whether you are in line with the law. And of course, this uh, this has never been done before. In the in the Portuguese judges, the court said that everything is fine. The, 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 those judges are fine. Uh, pay them little, and it's and it's okay. So in substance, the court had nothing to say. But the court prepared the ground to intervene in, in, in any potential situation, in any member state, in any kind of context where a fundamental dispute about the structure of, about the structural elements of the judiciary could arise. So from that moment on, given the wedding of Article 19, which basically says that there are courts in the European Union, there is nothing, and they, they exist at two levels. So Article 19 is not specific at all. Uh, connecting Article 19 to Article 2 makes all this constructive and less specific. So the court has untied its hands entirely in the name of uh, in the name of the rule of law uh, and allowed itself to to make a definite step into a, 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 a totally new ground uh, in terms of in terms of establishing jurisdiction. It, and it's, it's it's wonderful to have jurisdiction. Uh, and the court started using it in substance in order officially to protect the Polish courts. Uh, and, uh, and, and the decisions are quite clear. The decisions are groundbreaking simply because nothing like this has been done by a supranational or international organization before. Uh, the court directly orders the member states how to organize, manage, uh, and, uh, and reform the, the national judiciary systems. Uh, under under the pretext that those judges actually have some bearing on on the functioning of EU law, uh, even even better, uh, the court the court has been very clear on the simple fact that it's not necessary actually to prove any kind of specific connection with a case involving involving EU law in front of a particular organ or a particular judge. Uh, it's simply the very fact that the EU law could be invoked. That, that automatically triggers uh, or could trigger jurisdiction of the court. And this is all, this is of course very logical from the supranational perspective uh, and from the, from the perspective of the main methodology that the court has been using, which is the, the theological interpretation of the treaties from, the, from day one. Uh, but uh, it certainly is also surprising uh, because uh, if we look at the literature and the doctrine uh, and, and, the, and the case law of the court uh, since this is the very beginning and article 19 is this is the very beginning uh, there has not been so many calls to use article 19 in this particular way but uh, by saying not so many calls I actually uh, don't mean to say that nobody nobody argued that way in fact the great professor john usher the late professor john usher uh, made this argument in a number of his in a number of his uh, works uh, already in the middle of the 90s, saying let's connect the predecessor of Article 19 with the idea that the union is based on the rule of law. Uh, find it in the or wherever you want to find it. In fact, you just open the treaty, but it's law, and the idea that law is based on law, law somehow uses its own legal legal methodology and legal understandings of, of itself and, and, and its, its own functioning, that will be enough in order to in order to come up with a with a rule of law reading that will empower the court beyond what was uh, what was uh, explicitly explicitly delegated. And there is no explicit delegation, of course, on, on any kind of institutional structures of the member states. It was always taken to uh, it has always been uh, meant to uh, pertain to the sole jurisdiction of the member states. So, so the court has done this step and wonderfully, and this is the gift that Poland and Hungary keep on giving, uh, nobody objected to that. How can you object to the court trying to do something in, in, the, in the area of the rule of law in a situation when uh, a, a, knowing, a known fake Known court in one of the member states uh, rules that Article 6 ECHR is against the Polish constitution, presided by an individual who is not an constitutional court judge, who was elected in direct violation of the rules uh, when she was elected president and when she was elected judge. And in the in the in the presence of an avalanche of cases from the ECHR, which actually tell Poles, look, Poles. You don't have 
uh, like thousands of individuals who, who parade uh, in, in, in judicial gowns as judges are actually not judges. They are imposters. They are, they, 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 they are, they are fake members of fake institutions uh, who have never uh, had the right to sit and to issue any kind of decisions. And in this sense, the, the, there, is a, there is a remarkable uh, line of case law from, uh, from Strasbourg, uh, which creates overwhelming problems for the Poles for very good reasons, because the Poles uh, never bothered to follow their own law in reforming the judiciary, which means that uh, they, unlike Hungarians, they managed to break even the basic circular definition of the rule of law in the there, which has been with us uh, even at the supranational level since the 80s. So, uh, so the Poles are below the basic understanding of legality. And this is something that, uh, that cannot escape the watchful eye of, uh, of the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And the cases that come from there become harsher and harsher. Uh, so someone complained on Xero Floor, uh, a wonderful case, again, the facts don't interest us, but these are the guys who were, who were selling rolled grass. And the guys who, who were selling rolled grass brought down the highest judiciary of the of, uh, of one of the biggest member states of the European Union because the Court of Justice or the Court of Human Rights and Sarah Floor simply said, uh, never mind all these decisions. These guys are not judges. Uh, so there is nothing to talk about. Uh, you have a lot of paper coming from the court that calls itself one of the highest courts of the world. But in fact, this is not a court. Uh, they were not appointed. Uh, the, the, the decisions cannot have any legal value. Uh, so basically, go home, relax, and uh, Paul will, will, will pay you. Uh, will, will, will pay you, pay you for what you have suffered. And then thousands of other similar cases uh, went to Strasbourg. Uh, and and this uh, the, this kind of flow is not is not in any way exhausted. Uh, so the the, the number of uh, of uh, referrals from Poland is only growing. Uh, and that case concerning a, a, a particular fake, a fakely appointed individual who is not the judge, uh, was just uh, was just the precursor of uh, newer case law. Like there is this, uh, uh, it's difficult to pronounce, Jada, I think, uh, case. The, the the latest one when the, when the Court of Human Rights simply said all those fake individuals who were appointed by the fake council, the judiciary, which was uh, which was illegitimately. Uh, reformed by the by, by the governing party uh, in Poland, potentially are not are not really judges either, uh, and their decisions are not really court decisions. So, and we're speaking about uh, we're speaking about thousands of judges and dozens of thousands of decisions in all kinds of cases. So it could be that your divorce has never occurred, uh, that you haven't sold your garage, that I mean uh, any kind of bizarre mundane. Uh, mundane problems could arise uh, in the lives of uh, dozens of thousands of litigants in Poland and abroad, because uh, President Leonard's court still reinforces uh, mutual trust. And the situation arose where, uh, where the only thing that is enforced at the supranational level in the European Union, in the eyes of, in the light of what is coming from Strasbourg, is the mutual trust as a principle, not the substance of the values of Article 2 as a principle. So while, while the Strasbourg court now looks at, uh, at the substance of what is a court which is lawfully composed and which acts in the context of a legitimate and coherent uh, system of the judiciary of a member state, the court of justice looks at the enforcement of mutual trust no matter who is sending this, uh, uh, what is empty paper for Strasbourg, somehow is a judgment for the Court of Justice. So uh, what we see is a revolution in terms of substance because the Court of Justice now has jurisdiction and the Court of Justice started clarifying uh, what should happen on the ground, etc. But at the same time, this revolution led to a deep cleavage between what the Court of Justice considered, considers of fundamental importance and what the Court of Human Rights considers of fundamental importance. Because the Court of Justice has, uh, has extensively dealt with plenty of things, but one, and that one is what is a legitimately composed tribunal. 
this is ironical because uh, because the Court of Justice actually is famous for establishing a solid and coherent approach, supranational approach, to precisely what is a court of law in the context of Article 267. Uh, so you cannot send a preliminary reference if you are not independent, if you are not if you are not established by law, etc., etc., etc. We all know this criteria. And now the Court of Justice obviously and openly ignores the attempts of the Court of Human Rights to assess the Polish legal system more or less against the same criteria that the Court of Justice has established for itself. Because the Court of Justice didn't invent much. The Court of Justice was in full compliance with Article 6 until now. Because now it's impossible to say that uh, all those judges whose decisions, or so-called judges, whose so-called decisions are enforced by the Court of Justice as a direct application of the principle of mutual trust. So Dutch judges suddenly need to take empty paper, which is already declared by Strasbourg as empty paper, coming from, uh, from a non-judge, who sometimes is already named by name in the Strasbourg case law as a non-judge. And, and yet, in order to comply with the EU law, you have to say this non-judge actually is a judge. And here, Advocate General Bobic played a fundamentally uh, destructive role. Uh, and he played a fundamentally destructive role with a, with a bizarre uh, and quite non-elegant uh, gastronomical principle uh, that he introduced into the body of you law, the salami principle. Uh, because Advocate General Bobic told us in the, uh, in uh, one of the cases that unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, when we take a salami and we slice it at a certain point, it can be slightly rotten, but then we keep on slicing and the salami is good. And he applies the same to the national legal systems. He says the same with the Polish legal system. There is a rotten individual who is a non-judge. He's dressed as a judge, and he sits on a panel with other guys who actually are judges. So keep on slicing, and the legal system is okay. And this is something that is uh, that is uh, it's it's the noble judgment, but uh, noble ban. And uh, this is something that is absolutely not acceptable for the court of human rights. If your if your panel is uh, tinted by a fake individual who is dressed as a judge then unfortunately there is no judgment. And this is the this is the sole application of Article 6 since times immemorial, and there is, and there is case law on fake courts. Uh, thank you, Iceland. And the, also the brother court, or the little sister court, or, or the court of justice, the after court, dealt with fake appointments and, and uh, interferences with its independence. Uh, thank you, Norway. Uh, and there it said that, in fact, it's, it's fundamental to follow the basic appointment procedure, because if it's not followed, then there is no, there is, then there is no lawfully composed court. So, so th there seems to be no discussion whatsoever in the European legal space at the international level and also at the national level, because no, no Dutch uh, appellate court would agree that there is really a judgment if some, if some vague passerby would suddenly sign a decision sitting on a panel with real judges, even if dressed as a judge. This is what happens. With, this is what happens in Poland on the majority of panels, in the eyes of the Court of Human Rights, but not on, on not of the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice uh, purportedly is trying to save the fundamental principle of mutual trust in the European Union, but by these attempts, it's basically driving it. The, the, the basic values uh, into the ground. It's it's the burial site of the rule of law, the democracy, and uh, and and and, uh, and the respect of human rights, because you cannot enforce the procedure with uh, with purposefully closing your eyes on substance. And then the question arises: so the Salami principle is just an, is just another general opinion, but the court unfortunately agreed with that. Uh, in a very detrimental way, because uh, because all these fake judges are not idiots. The majority of them actually were really famous members of the judiciary, uh, famous professors, etc. So the, the the leading thinkers in the Polish system, uh, 
they just are united with the, with the governing party in their desire to abuse the institutions of the Polish state. And the, 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 the very reference on the 267 in this Jetlin Noble Bank case was, was introduced for one and only reason uh, in, order to, in order to precisely uh, make the Court of Justice say that the judge who sent the reference, who was a fake, who was not a judge, and it was, uh, and it was already known from, from a systematic re reading of the European Court of Human Rights case law, uh, that the judge was still a member of a legitimate panel and a member of a legitimate court. And uh, so it was, a, it was a hook which didn't even have a worm on it. And still the ECJ, being a very inert fish, got, uh, got uh, somehow caught uh, by, the, by the Polish imposters and indeed stated, well, this judge is, well, they didn't even specify, but it's, it's clear from the case. The, the judge is a fake, but the court is not a fake. And so the cleavage is overwhelming. This cleavage between the CHR and the ECJ on the very basic matter, who is a judge and who is a court. And then, uh, and then all, the, all the judges and all the member states applying the, uh, applying the principle of mutual trust, as they are indeed required by the Court of Justice, uh, face a moral dilemma and also a legal dilemma. Uh, because complying with the EU law today, in many cases involving any kind of Polish decisions, actually means disregarding European, European Court of Human Rights. And uh, whatever the Court of Justice think of, think about, thinks about itself, in terms of its standing in the hierarchy of European judiciary continent wide, uh, it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually quite clear that if uh, anyone anywhere in the member states actually accepts the reasoning of the Court of Justice, then that same case uh, has 100%, a 100% chance to win in front of the Court of Human Rights if it's appealed there. So it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, the Court of Justice is at the dead end, and, uh, and this dead end was absolutely not necessary. And here the question is why? And, uh, and I have my, my, my strange idea, which is partly grounded in a package of documents which I received one day uh, from, from an incognito person. It's a DHL that came on, uh, they came to my, uh, to my university address, uh, for which the, uh, the secretary signed. So it, it, was, uh, uh, it, it was a precious package, whatever you call it. I forgot how it's in Hungarian. Uh, I open it and it's, a, it's an incognito letter from a whistleblower from the court saying, I have never, uh, it, it introduced, the, the person introduced him or herself as saying, uh, I, I know life behind the Iron Curtain. And such kind of crazy stuff has never happened there because basic legality used to exist. And then come the, the minutes of the council meetings related to the illegal uh, dismissal of Advocate General Sharpston from the bench at the Court of Justice. And you read, I cannot check the authenticity of those documents, but if you, but if you read the case law uh, of the Court of Justice uh, regarding Sharpston appeals, it seems like it might have been true. Uh, the, and the, the minutes are uh, astonishing because the member states come together we, we don't know the precise uh, name or characterization of the composition, and this is what they played with in the Sharpson cases as well. Is it representatives of the member states? Is it the council? Uh, it's unclear. But they basically call President Leonard on the, uh, on the carpet, as it were. They, they, they invite the president of the court, and they tell him, we decided that you have to dismiss one of the members of the court. And then there is one hand in the room a Hungarian representative saying, we studied the treaties and we think it might be against the rule of law because there is no ground to dismiss. And it, it also goes against the cardinal principles uh, which have just been formulated by the Court of Justice in dozens of cases that, uh, that I describe in detail, critique in detail with Laurent Pesch in this report, uh, that you cannot under any, circum under any circumstances dismiss a sitting judge 
uh, in direct breach of all the procedures that you have, because the principle of security of tenure is the core, the cardinal principle, I quote the core directly, of Article 19, rather than combine, in combination with Article 2, in combination with Article 7 of the Charter, of Article 7 of the Charter. And it's also a violation of the law, uh, Article 6, uh, to start with. And the other member states say, come on. And President Leonard says, of course. So then the, the letter comes from President Leonard uh, telling the member states, look, member states, uh, actually, the, the advocate Jenna Sharpson is leaving. Uh, she learned about the letter from the letter itself. So please appoint someone else. And a fake appointment happens on the Court of Justice in direct violation of Article 6, uh, in direct copy of what uh, the, the, the European Court of Human Rights criticized in this judge judgment when it said uh, if uh, if there is a fake appointment, then there is, a, then there is no reason to to regard the panel as as a court composed by law. Uh, and there is the Greek there is the Greek guy who appears from nowhere and agrees to take office in full knowledge of the fact that he is not being legitimately appointed. So, and uh, I, I have been following the case. So I, 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 I wrote a couple of blogs together with Graham, with Graham Butler from Orcus, and we thought if he is really a, a renowned lawyer, then he should he should be proposed and immediately step down. It was the only uh, the only decent way to proceed for him, but somehow he stayed. And so we had the Pope and an anti-Pope. The anti-Pope clothed as an advocate general, uh, the Pope uh, releasing her shadow opinions on the blog of Professor Pierce. And as it happens, unsurprisingly, the shadow opinions are actually better than the, what is purportedly opinions of the fake advocate general. So for a year, we have the Court of Justice operating in exactly the same mode as the Polish Constitutional Court, World Supreme Court, etc., because uh, the member states, the sovereigns, just like the the Prawish uh in Poland, chose to ignore the law, and they co-opted the president of the institution in order to destroy all the principles of judicial independence and and and, and fundamental organization of the rule of law as applied to the judiciary in the court he was entrusted with. So here there is only one uh, difference between, between Poland and the European Union. In Poland, all the presidents of the courts who, who were independent actually stood by their judges. Every single court tried to use precisely Article 267 in order to fight back and question the illegitimate dismissals and appointments. And this is not what happened in the Court of Justice. In the Court of Justice, the uh, the, the only the only person who behaved decently in this in this really tragic context uh, was uh, was Judge Collins of the General Court who tried to who tried to block uh, the assault by the member states on the independence of the supranational institution, and he failed. Uh, and uh, he's now Advocate General Collins, a real Advocate General, next to the formerly fake. Uh, Advocate General, now now Advocate General Rantos, because he was lawfully reappointed, potentially in violation of the procedure, because Greece had to be well, it had to have one term or two, uh, and uh, we don't know what to do with this. It's utterly unnecessary. We're speaking about one year of Advocate General on the bench, of Advocate General Schwarz on the bench. Uh, the the decision of the member states is unlawful. Uh, with all respect to Hungary, but Hungarians are not angels in the rule of law, which is why it's it's, it's very ironical. If, if if we trust the the leaked documents which I have in my possession, there is much more there, but I cannot review anything. It's, it's humiliating for uh, for the key members of the Court of Justice, uh, unfortunately for them, and unfortunately for our union. Uh, and we don't know what to do because the court has attacked its own member simply because the member states wanted so. And the court failed to apply the core principles that emerged in the context of this revival of the substance of judicial independence of the, and the rule of law uh, to itself, when it itself found uh, found itself in the situation which is similar to uh, to the attacks that the Polish and Hungarian courts 
were experiencing at the national level. So what, uh, you know, to generalize it a little bit, uh, we, we, we got into a situation where the court obviously is, uh, has a self-interest in deviating from Article 6 in order to create a case law which is capable to hide, at least at the level of the courts, the Court of Justice case law, the fact that it itself was unfortunately falling short of meeting the basic standards of Article 6 ECHR and potentially was not a court at least for a year. At least on the panels where the fake uh, advocate general was involved, although I always, when, when I write about the cases uh, which were assigned to advocate general Thompson, I always cite her real opinions which were published by, uh, by Professor Pierce on his blog which what, what she calls shadow opinions, but they are not in the database. The database of the court presents the scribbles of the fake individual who is an imposter knowingly taking the place of Adekar General Sharpson on the bench as if he was an Adekar General. And of course, this is something that will, it will never go away because what, whatever happens during that year, in fact, is not, is, is not of fundamental importance. What is of fundamental importance is that the Court of Justice failed to demonstrate that it itself meets the basic requirements of Article 267, which it has established for all the national level courts in order to send requests for a preliminary ruling to itself. Because although it's established by law, it's obviously not independent from the, from the sovereign authority of the EU, which is the authority of the member states. And, uh, and this opens a small Pandora's box and, and calls for parallels with uh, with Poland and Hungary in the, in the most uh, in, in the most unflattering uh, way of parallelizing things, as it were. Uh, so plenty of problems there. But in terms of substance, we shouldn't be surprised because if because if we read opinion two thirteen, if we read uh, if we read the cases on the Turkish agreement, uh, if we read plenty of other relevant case law, it appears that the Court of Justice has never regarded itself as bound by the values of Article 2 in substance. They, pre, they, pre, they pretended as if all the values on which the union is purportedly based, we know that it was not, as I demonstrated from the very beginning, uh, actually were not uh, of any relevance to itself. So when, when we read, uh, when we read uh, 213, it's on black and white that, in fact, it's not a human rights institution. It's, a, it's something that would use human rights in order to advance the interests of the internal market. Fair enough. But, uh, but opinion 213 is in direct violation of Article 2. And this is something that certainly some members of the court uh, could sense uh, because it, it, was a, it was a full court panel, a way to co-op people into doing some horrible things, but not everybody signed. That's why that's why I have particular respect uh, to the to the Finnish back then Finnish judge on the court. Uh, he was a full member of the court. He was around, but his signature is not on that because I think signing this kind of opinions is precisely what ruins judicial careers. And what and what we have now is a is a basic uh, state of affairs at the supranational level in the EU is that is that a brilliant start of substantive rule of law uh, jurisprudence accompanied by a strong claim of jurisdiction coming from the Court of Justice in the, in the Portuguese judges case uh, is partly undone by, by a blunt failure to, pre to preserve the basic independence of the Court of Justice. So the next step would be to undo this harm in, in one, one way or another and to provide absolute guarantees that the member states will not be able to interfere next time they want to interfere with the composition of the Court of Justice in direct violation of the treaties and, uh, and, and also of ECHR law. Of course, the, of course, the court is not, uh, it always underlines we are not members, etc. In this sense, it's, it's the, uh, I used to say, it's the only system besides Belarus, but now Russians join. So we have three systems in continental Europe which think that they're above human rights law 
and that their citizens don't need protection of the of the continental uh, continent wide human rights protection system. Uh, Belarus is the true is the traditionalist. Then there is uh, Co Court of Justice and the EU uh, after the 2013. And now there are Russians after they started massacring Ukrainians. Who it, it's unclear whether they were kicked out or they left themselves. Uh, there is a there is a big debate about that. Uh, but there is a fundamental difference between the Russians and, and the European Union. The European Union never joined. And I think never joining is a sin when, uh, when you have a functioning and robust human rights protection system and when you know that as a very powerful actor uh, and a very powerful legal system, you, you are bound, on, at least on some occasions, to emerge as an actor of injustice. And we can speak about that uh, for ages as well, especially in, in relation to uh, to the people dying in the Belarusian forests and and uh, the thousands drowned on purpose uh, by Frontex in cooperation with some Libyan thugs. And there is now research emerging on on uh, on routine intelligence sharing between uh, between those uh, Libyan criminals and Frontex funded by uh, well our taxpayer money. So we're killing thousands of people. We're paying for paying for this, and uh, this this leads uh, some commentators, the the more the more realistic commentators, like Ian Urbina, for instance, who had a spectacular article in the New Yorker about this, to call Frontex the air force of the Libyan thugs, they, because they could not afford that. Of course, you need all these drones, all this uh, all this uh, recognition recognition planes, satellites. Everything is put, put at their disposal because uh, because it's not a sea rescue operation. It's a it's a capture operation in order to enslave people uh, who are innocent and put them indefinitely into these prisons funded by the European Union while they await ransom coming from their families. And this is more or less what. Uh, my Yale lecture two, two weeks ago was about, and Ian Urbina actually joined uh, from, from, from his offices on the Mediterranean Sea and gave a lot of amazing, amazing information on how this intelligence sharing actually happens. So, the, so any system which is robust in terms of protecting human rights has to be a member of the continental, uh, continental human rights protection system and has to make sure that this kind of substantive, routine, and mass substantive human rights violations never happen. From right to life to, to whatever you want, because thousands of people are being tortured today because of, because of our funding and because of the training of the thugs using our intelligence. And uh, of course, the President von der Leyen will be happy to justify it for you, uh, but uh, I think we all celebrate all those who who are human rights aware, we also celebrated the, uh, the fact that the, the head of Frontex is fired. But I think it's a misplaced celebration because he was doing his job as, as his agency was designed. There is no other reason for Frontex to exist rather than to make sure that thousands of people are imprisoned because they are not white and because they come from the wrong direction and because they have a different citizenship from ours, etc., etc., etc. So plenty of problems there. And the Court of Justice is unlikely to solve those problems as long as it takes strong opposition to the substance of, of, of fundamental rights, as we saw from, from 213 and to, to Article 6. So uh, the fact that Ranto sat there for a year as a, as, as a member of the court uh, is more telling than some fake court in Poland actually telling us that they think that Article 6 is against the Constitution. Because, because in the European Union, Article 6 is nothing, since we have opinion 213. And the Court of Justice doesn't, is not afraid of losing face uh, as a result of uh, openly defying uh, Article 6. So I, I wrote a longer text about this, which is appearing in the European Law Journal. You would say European Law Journal is a fake journal. Uh, there are all the scandals around the European law journal, but I will tell you, actually, good for us. Why? Because it's only this kind of fake renegade journal that can accept research which is truly critical about the European Union. 
And I can tell you, I tried every journal in the world. And all of them told, to, told me basically, we don't quite understand this anti-European writing uh, because I think you probably uh, miscalculated the way how primary law works because the sovereign cannot violate primary law. But the paper was already online because Professor Weiler put it up as a, as a Jean Monnet working paper at NYU and it was circulated in all law schools. Does it have citations? None. But I didn't expect citations because it's unpatriotic. It's, it's unpatriotic to cite this kind of work. It's like uh, if Ian Urbina wrote, uh, wrote an academic article about the practical operation of Frontex as an Air Force of Bolivian thugs, that article most likely would not have been cited by uh, human rights minded uh, EU lawyers. Although in asylum law, actually, there is more, there are more critical voices. So in this sense, asylum law is, is much better stuffed with, with academics than, than uh, the, the, the sub substantive uh, independence of, uh, of the court of justice uh, law, if, if it's at all a field, because nobody has ever suspected that there would be, correct me if I'm wrong, that there would be problems in that, in, in that kind of area of law. Uh, so I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that, uh, that the article appears. And, and of course, uh, this, uh, in the European law journal being a really good journal, they, they, they try to, to keep the, uh, the, the basic standards high. Uh, so I know that Elke Jenner-Schausen herself was one, of the, one, was one of the peer reviews in the text. Uh, don't doubt that I know, uh, but uh, we, we together with my co-author we received amazing, uh, amazing feedback. And uh, Graham Butler from uh, from Orbis, Su super I guess uh, superb uh, and also a little bit crazy because we we saw what was going on with the Serantos and uh, the direct uh, direct violation of everything that the EU proclaims to follow by. And we basically, uh, we saw each other a couple of times very briefly in Denmark and Sweden, but uh, we agreed on Twitter that we should immediately write about it. And then there was a, light, uh, a line of uh, Kerpassons blog posts, which were uh, very vividly uh, responded to, let's put it that way. Even the members of Ranta's family uh, bothered to write to us personally uh, asking to stop the attacks against the most distinguished Greek lawyer. We didn't reply to that, because to us he's not a lawyer. If he failed to understand that he's being used as a pawn in the, in the fight by the member states against the basic independence of the, of the only court in the system of integration through law. Uh, so I stop here, but uh, I'm very open indeed to your questions. And I will be happy to share the paper, but the, 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 the updated text of the paper on, on the Sharpson case is slightly long because there are plenty of cases and, and uh, the, the number of violations of, of basic law and procedure is such that it, it necessitated 50 pages of simply uh, black, letter, uh, black letter discussion just to, to make sure that uh, no possible loophole is used by those uh, who somehow would, would not take the Hungarian perspective in the secret documents that we disclosed, uh, disclosed to me. And there was a, uh, the, the last point. I was not the only recipient of this, of this friendly package. Also, Laurent Pesch, who is my author on the rule of law stuff, received the same. And then, you, and then we had a phone call and we think we're good. And, uh, and also, the, so, so the, package, uh, the, the package came to the office. The secretary signed for it and she said it came from the Court of Justice. It's, it's thick and it's, it's large. She thought it was very important. Uh, I was abroad. She called the former head of uh, my department, uh, Professor Gomri, who uh, who ran into the office to have a look at the package. He, I, I authorized him to open it. He opened it, and then and then he, he calls me, saying, "I cannot use the scanners of the faculty to scan this for you, unfortunately, because I think it's quite sensitive." Uh, so he he used the scanner at home. Well, uh, but now it's all, it's, uh, now it's in the footnotes. So I, I have a footnote to this package of documents, 
I, I openly state that I cannot, uh, I cannot check its, uh, its authenticity, but uh, uh, I find that I, if it's really true, uh, then uh, I almost respect the Hungarian representative uh, who was uh, as crucial in the destruction of the rule of law in his system as President Leonard's has been uh, in, the, in the system of, uh, of our supranational law in Europe. Thank you, Dimitri. I'll stay here if you can. I stay here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm sure there are questions. I have lots of questions myself, but no, I will refrain. I think whoever wants to come in the room needs to come to the mic so that everybody can hear. And uh, anyone on the chat can write and um, also take I probably, the floor. Yeah, probably give uh, one last clarification. So, in in the in the paper with uh, with Butler, we try, we try to understand what could stop the assault by the member states on the port, and 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 we come to the conclusion that the crucial weak link was indeed the present of the court, because without the letter of the president about the vacancy, the member states had no way at all to, to proclaim that it existed. They could they could they, they could have come in, in any kind of composition at any kind of level. They could they could have passed any kind of declarations on what they think about the court. But without the voice of the president, that the president is ready to give up one of the sitting members in direct contradiction uh, with uh, with primary law, it would have been impossible for the member states to act. And then uh, and then the second actor who could intervene and save the situation a little bit. Uh, again, it's it's not about one year of sharps and tenure. It's about, it's about the principle that the sovereign should not intervene in direct violation of the law uh, with the composition of the courts who should precisely bring that sovereign to account. So this is what our article about, and this is what Sharpson fight, the Sharpson's fight has been about. So the second institution that could intervene was the 255 committee. And the 255 panel, of course, uh, acts absolutely independently. They establish their own rules of procedure. Uh, they themselves vet who is good enough to sit on the Court of Justice? If they say no, then the member states usually say, well, uh, no, then no. And they, they act on the assumption that when they inform that someone is, is about to take, to take office as one of the members of the court, that person indeed will be appointed in response to an existing vacancy as the law, as the law functions. But, uh, but they could see right away, once the, once the name of Rantos was proposed, that the vacancy was non-existent and was not even coming up, which means that it was the duty of the 255 committee not to assess the, the readiness or the, 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 the aptitude of uh, Judge Rantos uh, for taking office. Of course he's qualified and, and uh, we should be absolutely clear that it's, it's not about the personalities, it's not about Sharpson, it's not about Rantos, it's a little bit about Rantos because because he knew that he was breaking the law, uh, but uh, but we should uh, we should make sure that the court actually preserves independ independence and in substance, and also independence in uh, in appearance. And here both uh, both are broken. Panel two five five is accountable to the president of the court of justice. But it's also independent. It is independent, but it is accountable. And also the th and also the third, also accountable to the present president, the third potential actor who could uh, uh, whose whose failure of independence is, is clear from the whole story is the general court. Mm -hmm. So the general court doesn't appear to exist as an independent mm -hmm. court. Correct. Uh, which means that it's a. Uh, it's quite difficult again to assess it against Article Six because because uh, one of the one the, one of the fundamental aspects of judicial independence in Europe, which is the ABC of the rule of law, is that there should be no direct instructions or no uh, or no interference with independence within the court structure between the different elements of the court structure once once the case has been assigned. And, and, and here we had, uh, we had a clear situation where the, the Court of Justice unlawfully took the case from the general court and basically decided it. And then, and then the general court had nothing to do, but well, the, the general court could have said, actually, uh, this is rubbish, you don't have this uh, authority, etc. you broke the law, but then they would have simply reconfirmed what they have done. So the general court simply emerged as a non-court as well. And given the importance of the cases that go to the general court, 
again, uh, so we, we just wanted to, to raise a couple of uh, uh, alarm signals uh, with, this, with this long article. If it, and it, so the, the article was submitted to the, to the Commonwealth Market Law Review. It was, it was ready to be published basically uh, already one year ago. Uh, the Commonwealth Law Review said we will review it. It's an important issue. Uh, three, three days pass and they say, unfortunately, the article is unreviewable because we promised someone else uh, that they will write about it and somehow we have forgotten. Uh, so we are not interested in your work. And it will not be published. Way. Yes. Uh, with the European Law Review. So promises are made that nothing has been published on those cases in the Comarch Law Review and never will for obvious reasons. Uh, so this whole, the, this whole story also raises obvious questions about uh, the basic independence of academics in the context of uh, the analysis of EU law. Uh, so it's, it's just a really a Pandora's box that got opened and the majority of people would like not to notice uh, while there are plenty of implications for, for their daily bread and daily life as, uh, as scholars and as judges. Thank you, Dimitri. Well, that uh, brings me to the point that I wanted to read, which is a non-essential point, but still the importance of working papers. Because actually, yes, you do tumble against such attitude with well-established journals that, you know, this is booked, this slot is booked, you know, that case has been taken, is reserved, whatever, you do have that very often. You mentioned that, you know, your work has been published as a working paper in a very decent collection, obviously, and it will have an impact whether it's published in a journal or not. And whether it's cited or not. Whether uh, it's so cited and, or not, it will and, have an I, I fully agree. So the so the working papers are absolutely crucial and fundamental. And we saw this with the UI working papers and also with NYU working papers, especially the two, yeah. the two main, main series, probably. Uh, and the, the working papers are also reviewed in detail. And in fact, when they're signed off. They are academic uh, pieces of work. Exactly. Uh, and besides working papers, also blogging, because if they, if you dare to put something in a respectable blog, uh, you put your you put your reputation on the line. And uh, even if it's not even if it's not peer reviewed, it can be a much more important piece of work With and much more impact than uh, than a peer reviewed boring yeah. article in the journal that nobody has access to. Yeah. Uh, so we need to rethink how how, how, this, we how these things work. How we disseminate? How we communicate? And actually, uh, the first working paper of uh, the EU pop, Jean Monnet Mocio, is precisely on what you're discussing, actually. <laughs> I haven't seen it <coughs> yet. The, the one uh, we wrote with like, Jacqueline ah. last year. So this is the actual... I didn't realize it was an EU pop working paper. It is an EU pop working paper. <coughs> so it is the inaugural working paper of uh, the EU pop Jean Monnet Mocio, and it covers uh, quite a lot of things that you have. Um, I need to, I need to... Uh, refer to? to? <coughs> the analysis doesn't necessarily go in the same sense because I like your analysis that it's much more global and much more interdisciplinary and looks into, you know, decision making. I like that. The working paper doesn't do that. It, it's more perhaps doctrinal or black laser. Mm -hmm. But there is so much to say about the case law. Absolutely. This is Absolutely. amazing. Thank you so much. Evelina, you wanted to ask something? So can you come here? Dear Dmitry, thank you very much for your speech. I was far of uh, <laughs> this topic, the rule of law. I was interested about migration and uh, we understand generally the rule of law. It's to follow law. And um, after your report, I, of course, I have my national interest, the perspective of Ukraine because Ukraine wanted uh, European integration 10 years ago, but we uh, thought we were ready to integrate. But uh, we didn't uh, take into account uh, the rule of law in our country 10 years ago now and in perspective, because uh, frankly speaking, we have uh, um, previously have now the problem with corruption. And uh, you know, the court of Ukraine, we prefer simple people to start quarrel or scandal and to solve our problem just in a personal level, but not to go to the court. 
because we do not believe that it will be it will quickly and, uh, and it will be um, justice. How do you estimate the perspective of Ukraine? If you uh, criticize Poland and uh, Hungary, <coughs> and we know and understand the situation of our country in this level, how do you estimate the perspective of Ukraine in this case? If without war, we, uh, we hope that... No, this is, a super, this is a superb question, which... Uh, which, which, which kept, we, yeah, which kept me busy, in fact, for a while. So I, uh, I, I took part in several panels on Ukrainian accession with, with Professor Petrov from Give Me Hill Academy, uh, with Daniel uh, Samiente from, uh, from Complutense in Madrid, and uh, several other leading schools. And they disagree with me, but I published a couple of small pieces uh, arguing that almost immediate accession is possible uh, once the war once the war stops, because with all respect, Poland is infinitely worse than Ukraine will ever be, because it's impossible, I think, outside of the Polish context, to expect any member state of the Council of Europe, uh, not even Russians actually, uh, when they used to be members, uh, to uh, to ask the leading court in their system to proclaim that Article 6 SHR is against the Constitution. It means that they don't have a Constitution. It's simply it's simply a death, uh, death sentence to their whole system of law. Thanks God nobody takes that seriously because we know that it's not the court. And the Court of uh, Human Rights itself laughed at it, rightly, uh, because uh, if, if your janitor comes and writes that Article 6 is not is not part of the Ukrainian constitution. It makes no sense to treat the janitor as a member of the court of law. What happens in Poland? So in Poland, uh, po Polish legal system is in ruins. Uh, Polish uh, Polish judges, the last remaining, who fight bravely for for their basic independence, for for the basic value of the law, including EU law, deserve an immense amount of respect because because everything is is against them in that non system. Because all the, of course, all the fakes try to pressure. So Ukraine is much, much better, and uh, it's much, much better also in terms of uh, the speed of reconstruction after the war, because the, because the amount of Russian money that has been confiscated from the central bank and from the oligarchs and from the state companies, etc., is is enormous. So if you if you look at the at the amount of support that uh, that all the central and Eastern European states received. It was many times smaller than uh, than what has been confiscated, and of course, uh, a lot of rebuilding will need to be done. But this rebuilding can now be funded if we find the suitable legal means, etc., to make sure that the money is put to good use. There is already there, there is already a bill pending in Congress. There is already uh, a number of uh, statements by von der Leyen, by by Borrell, by leading figures at the supranational level and who enjoy support at the national level in the European Union that this money should, should belong to Ukraine. This is not the money that we can give back. This is not the money that we should exclude, that we should appropriate for ourselves uh, in, in the member states. So there, is, there are ways to rebuild Ukraine quickly with a, with a huge flood of, uh, of financial resources that are already there, confiscated from, uh, from the Russians. And then in terms of the nitty gritty of the, of the accession law, how, how Article 49 can function, uh, I, can, I can send you a couple of papers that I have written. Uh, one with uh, Ronald Janssen, who is the who is the editor in chief of the Hague Journal of the Law, uh, and who, who has recently published uh, recently published this piece on conditionality in ICON in the International Journal of Constitutional Law, uh, that shows that in fact accession moment can predate the the detailed acceptance of the IT at the national level, which means that what we can have in Ukraine. Is, uh, is accession first, and then long transitional periods that will result in the eventual full compliance with the uh, with the whole body of the law. This is this is basically possible. This is what we had. This is what we had with Greece. Actually, this is what we had with uh, with the UK with transitional periods up to eleven years, and uh, we, we simply need to return to the to the standard mode of accessions as it was understood in the first three rounds of enlargement, uh, before it came to be tinted by, by the uh, distrust, mistrust uh, towards the nations behind, who used to be behind the Iron Curtain. And we see that the, the new approach that was, that was applied to Poland, Hungary, and other countries uh, is an absolute moral and practical failure.
because the countries that were scrutinized the most uh, with this pre-accession exercise, etc., dozens of years wasted, uh, dozens, uh, dozens of thousands of people involved, not necessarily to, uh, to the good end, uh, resulted in unsustainable uh, member states that, that should have never behaved this way if we look at Poland and Hungary. So if the, if the traditional approach has failed, then it makes, it makes sense to step back to the UK, UK accession approaches and UK accession level uh, and taking the money on board that we already have, organize a super martial plan for Ukraine and admit it into the union as soon as possible. So that's, that's my basic perspective that I try to defend. The only fear is the corruption. In but all the institutions will have to be built in new, basically. It must be all <clears throat> No, old ways cannot be used because the old uh, habits that we had in our juries and court, they ruined our trust to, to the state. So, of course, we hope that the best experience will be borrowed in Ukraine and hope. But we <laughs> want to predict and not wait 10 years more. <laughs> Let it be as soon as possible. Yes, 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 and it, it, it will be a boost if, uh, if there is actual help provided by the leading actors on both sides of the ocean mm -hmm. with all the money that can be invested. Uh, it's possible to build, uh, to build a new country quite, uh, quite quickly. And it, it, there will be a need, because I mean, now, if, if you look at what's going on uh, in Ukrainian cities, uh, in the East, especially in the South, it's a disaster. So this kind of disaster has to stop as soon as possible, and then everything needs to be rebuilt. Yes. Uh, and, and, and thank you, because your question led to framework in mind. The thing is, well, about the war, I think we don't have enough research on the impact of um, the Ukrainian conflict didn't start yesterday or in February, just starting in 2013. And we are you know, not yet aware, uh, and we haven't studied that in other conflicts to show the divisions within that society. So yes, money is good, new institutions are good, but if the society is divided within, then we, the outsiders, will find it very difficult to take uh, wise decisions. And Cyprus is a very good example on that in 1960, brand new constitution, everything should be working. The whole thing collapsed after two and a half years because nobody, maybe nobody took into account uh, the internal divisions that already existed and were bringing forth 30 and years and in advance. external Yes. yes. Uh, well, the external we have studied a lot, but the internal is equally important and this has been majorly neglected and still being neglected in the way we talk about conflict. Syria, for example, we talk about Russia and the US, but within Syria there are some, some tense of separate uh, blocks and these are the people that are going to restart the country so we don't know there is a lot that we don't know um, so thank you for that and my question was you said um, ideally that you should go back to uh, enlarging in the way that it was done up to the third enlargement I am not very familiar with uh, the major differences and I have only lived the 2014 enlargement onwards uh, but my question is up to um, let's say the Treaty of uh, Maastricht, 1992, right? The Union still had this very economic uh, internal market outlook, whereas now it has gone into a Union that does a lot more than that, at least on paper. Uh, so my question is, is that kind of accession, uh, in the, the early accessions, is that compatible with what the Union is presenting itself to be at the moment, which is much broader than what it was back then? Yeah, this, this is a very good question. So obviously the, the law has grown, mm -hmm. but uh, my, my remarks related to the principle. So the principle changes uh, precisely, well, it, it's unrelated to Maastricht. So following, uh, fo following the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the European Union uh, put mistrust at the, at the core of its approach to enlargement regulation. Before, uh, the, the member states, pro new member states, had to promise that, that they will take up EU law. Uh, some uh, some uh, transitional periods, sometimes extremely long, uh, were put into place, and then guidance was offered and provided uh, by the union in order to, to help those, those member states, actual member states already, 
uh, to take up the law. So since the transition periods were in force, uh, there was no expectations that they will comply in full, precisely because uh, because of the agreements that were made in the, in the context of, uh, of of the signing of treaties of accession. Uh, so the the act of accession were extremely detailed. Uh, so first you first first you exceed, and then you work on uh, working with the law in full. This is, this is what happened with the GDR in the context of the German uh, Federal Republic. Uh, this is what uh, this is what frequently happens. It's not the GDR first adopted uh, federal law, mm -hmm. and then ten years after was admitted as as, as part of Germany. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, this is the approach that uh, that was favored in the uh, as a follow up of the of the fall of the, fall of the Berlin Wall. So all the member states that joined in this big bang enlargement and after first had to be had to be ready in terms of adopting all of the EU law, and then accession would happen. So ultimately, as ultimately, it's a matter of principle. It, it doesn't even change much, uh, but but proclamations matter. So in the, the 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 pure symbolic value of stating that yes, Ukraine is part of the EU now, for instance, in 2025 when the war is over and the construction has started, even if a large chunk of EU law doesn't actually apply, but we know when it will apply. It can be 20 years. Depends on on what is agreed and, and, and how the time frame is built, mm -hmm. and uh, all this should incorporate uh, the emergency stop and emergency break provisions. Of course, uh, if Ukraine goes bananas and uh, and nothing works, uh, then there should there should be ways to freeze it as it is and to limit uh, to limit its participation in institutions, etc. So basically, Article Seven on steroids, which is invocable automatically, and where the Court of Justice also plays a role. All this can be done in the context of the of the act of accession and the nexus to the act and the treaty of accession. This is all primary law. Uh, this is all primary law, which which takes precedence over other primary laws we know from uh, from the other pre-accession contexts, because all the deviations, which obviously deviate from uh, from unchangeable from unchangeable key, uh, could work until the end of the transition periods. And nobody went to the court of justice saying. Actually, the Treaty of Accession uh, violates the, uh, the Treaty of the European Union, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. It would be unthinkable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this Act of Accession will be able, de facto, for a time, not forever, to amend the Treaty on the European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union as far as those apply to Ukraine. And uh, if we set a time frame of 25, 30 years, I mean, it's, uh, it's 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 absolutely doable and reasonable, and, uh, and, and the expectations could be could be immediately high, because because the symbolic value of the succession will be immense following the war, and will obviously help boost reconstruction, especially with all the money available. So so I think it's it's not so much how much law we have, but what kind of approach we deploy in order to make sure that all of this law is actually made operational in the new member state. And uh, ironically, if you if we look at the temporary protection that Ukrainians enjoy now in the European Union, they have more rights without any kind of pre-accession talks than Poles, for instance, or Hungarians, or, or Slovaks had after they acceded to the EU because there was seven seven year break on free movement. So a Pole simply couldn't uh, couldn't cross uh, cross the border into Germany and accept gainful employment. Something that that the Ukrainian now benefiting from the from the temporary production can do, and uh, this kind of this kind of signs uh, show overwhelming benevolence of the member states, which is already on the ground politically, uh, in terms of in terms of extending actual workable rights, compared even with the uh, with the last uh, with, with the with the with the last uh, what used to be new member states. Uh, as they as they were making their way to full acceptance of their key after the accession. Uh, so if we if we if we put all this together, I think uh, there is uh, there is political will uh, to think differently. And this political will obviously is boosted by what's going on in Poland and Hungary. If all the independent commentators and uh, and then Jews busy with this assess Hungary as non-democracy. And the Article Two somehow presumes that the Union is a union of democracies. Then it's clear that uh, the approach that brought Hungary into the Union, without any kind of sufficient consolidation, and and the, the country which is at the state where 
uh, a significant step back was absolutely possible and almost immediate following the accession, because the historical time, even in the, in the context of the history of the Union, uh, the time that happened uh, between current Orban terms and, uh, and the accession of Hungary is, uh, is negligible. Uh, so we cannot use old approaches uh, with Ukraine or with any other candidates. And here, the, the most standard question that uh, uh, that uh, colleagues usually ask, especially those who come from Western Balkans, is how come you forget Western Balkans? Aren't you afraid that you will undermine the legitimacy of the Union, etc.? And my answer is the Union doesn't have any legitimacy in Western Balkans because it made all the promises and it ignored all the promises that it has made. So, so if those guys are, are, are expecting something, well, they are, they're either fools or they play as if they're not fools. Uh, which means that there is no legitimacy to lose in the context of the pre-accession when we speak about Western Balkans. And uh, Ukraine, precisely, if it's dealt with differently compared with uh, the old approaches, will be, will, will be a way to boost the performance of EU accession law uh, and, and bring it to such a level that would make the actual accession of the Western Balkans possible. Because, uh, because at this stage, obviously, there is no such possibility. Pleasure. There is a long comment in your chat. I think it's for the previous presentation. Is it for the well, previous presentation? And it's on India, isn't it? Yeah, yes, it's on uh, the role of judges, uh, judges in India. Yeah, okay, the so there's a just general comment. You're on India, you cannot comment, oh, unfortunately. So, I, I, I do have and a, a common question based on mm -hmm. something you said towards the beginning of, of your speech, and it's uh, about, uh, about your embrace of uh, Sadursky's uh, connection between a change in the treatment of the rule of law and democracy after the, the big expansion of, of the EU. And I, I understand that point, but what, what I'm considering, what I'm asking is, is the following. Do you think that the fact that we witness failures of the rule of law and democracy in other countries, kind of consolidated democracies, causes us to rethink uh, that approach of the court? And what I mean by that is the following. Maybe the court changed its approach, and I, I agree with you that it has. So it changed its approach, maybe partly because of distrust towards the, the new democracies, <clears throat> but also because there was already, or one could see a potential global decline of democracy of or rule of law norms and so forth. That is not necessarily explicitly and definitively linked to the expansion. It's so a very good question. Uh, I I don't think, well, I think the best approach to the Court of Justice is to view it as a self-serving institution. So, and I, and I wrote a, a small paper which the Polish Yearbook of International Law published, uh, which is called The Power Grab and Context, on the actual influence of, the, of all this glorious case law of the Court of Justice, which I applaud and adore, and which I described in detail with Laurent Pesch, uh, but on, on the influence of that on the ground. And there has been no influence. So Poland is not at all better off, and Hungary is not at all better off as a result of all this commotion uh, on Kirchberg. Uh, so the, there is only one winner in this case law as emerging, emerging in practice. And that winner is the Court of Justice itself, because it has claimed new jurisdiction for itself. Now it has, uh, it has overwhelming new power over all the member states, not only Poland and Hungary, it can potentially tell Malta or the Netherlands or Estonia uh, what is wrong with, uh, with their courts, something that would have been unthinkable before, uh, which means that this self-serving side of what the Court of Justice is doing is fundamentally important. And here, uh, if this is the right perspective, then probably uh, we, can, we can try to assess what is actually the backbone of the legal system uh, in the name of which sacrifices are made by the member states and by individual Europeans, uh, which would become uh, comparable to dignity in Germany or laïcité en France. And 
that uh, that emerging keyword probably is supremacy and uh, and unquestionable authority of the Court of Justice of the European Union. There is a uh, there is nothing else that uh, that would emerge as a candidate uh, to this to this fundamental place. And if that is the case, then we should obviously take Article Two from ground size because. Uh, because Article 2 doesn't name supremacy among the fundamental values of the EU. And because supremacy actually is, is not a substantive, but a, but a procedural principle. So the EU emerges as a, as a procedure-driven institution which, uh, which uh, has a self-serving interest in making sure that, uh, that it remains in charge and that it can dictate and, and, expect, and expect benevolent answers. Uh, from the authorities of the member states, and uh, this is this is then the framework of analysis that uh, that I would offer. And it's it's probably not what uh, what official textbook uh, assessment would be, but if we look at at the even at the substantive understanding of the rule of law that the Court of Justice proposes, uh, supremacy is always part of the picture. So they say supremacy of law would not be possible as the rule of law is blah, 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 blah. And this is an absurd non starter because you cannot sacrifice this, the substantive elements of national constitutional systems in the name of someone's supremacy somewhere. It should be, it should be precisely the other way around. Supremacy should, be, uh, should, should exist in the substantive interest of the fundamental values. And this is not, uh, this is not the state of development of the union today. That's why we can have uh, we can have Frontex uh, uh, using proxies to kill thousands of people, and it's fine. And that's why uh, that's why we can have uh, member states uh, uh, whose whose constitution doesn't accept Article 6 CHR, and it's fine. And even uh, if even the the conditionality regulation doesn't seem to apply to Poland. Uh, so while Hungary will be sanctioned in some way. After the Commission has overwhelmingly helped Torbay to to win the last election by precisely not sanctioning him, there is a double game. Uh, Poland will not be sanctioned. Why? Because they love Ukrainians. But is it is it the Polish state or is it or is it the Polish people? The people are pressed by the state as it exists today, without the rule of law, without democracy, mm. and now without human rights. And we use the benevolence of the people who do the right thing. As a justification, to make sure that those people don't get human rights, democracy, and uh, this to me is something that is a that is a non sequitur. You cannot have this kind of uh, this kind of built up in practice. But but this is how the EU works. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dmitry, for for your My lecture. Uh, extremely interesting and thought provoking. Thank actually. you. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for sticking around. Now we're going to take a, a lunch break.